politics. And I think that that's probably one of the most fortunate things that ever happened to me, that I was born in the 50s and got raised in the 60s. Because in the 60s, we had a different attitude about everything. And to come of age during the 60s, when black was beautiful, when revolution was in the air, and if you ask me, I was waiting for the revolution to come any moment. Because I got the message on the radio that kept saying the revolution will not be televised. And so I knew it was coming. I thought somewhere in North Philly, all I had to do was watch TV, you know, Channel News, Channel 6 Action News, and then run to North Philly when the revolution came. And so, you know, I was waiting on the revolution. I was preparing myself for the revolution. I remember as a teenager how radical I was allowed to be. I remember the moment in my life in the 1960s when I washed all the heat out my hair and went natural. And I remember going around the school with my uncut, unshaved natural. And people, as I was a child, used to say, oh, she's such a cute little girl. But they stopped saying I was cute when I washed my hair out, you know. And I remember thinking, we're about to take the power. And I wanted to do so much, I wanted to be part of that movement. Well, like some of you, I waited and I waited and I waited. And that revolution didn't come, not the way I had hoped it would. But I do want to say I recognize that some things have changed, but they haven't changed enough. Dr. Patricia Reed Merritt, author, educator, scholar, and performing artist, is the distinguished professor of social work and Africana studies program coordinator at the Richmond Stockton College in Pomona, New Jersey. She is also the founder and artistic director of Afro One Dance, Drama, and Drum Theater a community-based cultural and performing arts organization currently celebrating its 39th year of operation. Dr. Reed Merritt received the Doctorate of Social Work in Race, Law, and Social Policy from the University of Pennsylvania, the Master of Social Work in Direct Practice from Temple University, and the Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Social Science from Cabrini College. She received her arts training in the city of Philadelphia, having studied at the Sydney King School of Dance, the Eakins Arts Center, and Cabrini College. Dr. Patricia Reed Merritt is the author of the National Black Board Bestseller. You probably have seen this book, may even have it. Sister Power, How Phenomenal Black Women Are Rising to the Top. Sister Wisdom, Seven Pathways to a Satisfying Life for Souls for Black Women was also published by uh, Wiley in 2002. And then her book, Righteous Self-Determination, The Black Social World Work Movement in America, came out in 2010. Dr. Reed Merritt is a regular contributor to scholarly journals and magazines and has made more than 200 appearances on TV and radio stations throughout the country. A resident of Hamilton County, New Jersey, Hamilton Township, New Jersey, Dr. Reed Merritt is a well-known scholar and lecturer. She has presented scholarly papers and keynote addresses at numerous conferences throughout the United States and in the international communities of Kenya, Brazil, Egypt, France, South Africa, England, and Venezuela. In the summer of 1993, she spent four weeks at the University of Ghana as a Ford Fellow with the National Council of Black Studies, for Black Studies. A community-oriented activist scholar, she has also served as the statewide coordinator of the New Jersey Black Family Summit, sponsored by the Black United Fund. She was the founding president of the Association of Black Women in Higher Education, Philadelphia chapter having served previously on the National Board of Directors. Dr. Reed Merritt served as a founding president of the Burlington County Black Business and Professional Association and as founding president of the National Association of Black Social Workers, South Jersey chapter. For 16 years, 1994 to 2010, she served on the Board of Directors for the National Council for Black Studies. And she was a, um, a profound influence and uh, power on that council. Dr. Reed Merritt is a recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the Caprini College Distinguished Alumni Achievement Award, the Temple University General Alumni Society Certificate of Honor, 
the NAACP Freedom Award, the Richard Stockton College's Council of Black Faculty and Staff Annual Achievement Award, and the National Council for Black Studies Presidential Award in 2002. She has been honored by the New Jersey State Council of Black Social Workers as Social Worker of the Year, the New Jersey State Legislature, and in 1997, she was named by City News as one of New Jersey's 100 most influential citizens. She is listed in Who's Who in America, Who's Who Among Black Americans, Outstanding Young Women of America, and 2,000 Notable American Women, and she's married to the great William T. Merritt, and they have four children. She is also my friend, and we are so happy to have you come and address us. Thank you. So much. Hotel. Hotel. That's my first reaction, the first thing I said, the first thing I feel. I don't want to go after Dr. West. Uh, that's what I was thinking. Uh, the cameraman came over and said, I don't see Dr. Jeffries here. You better hope he comes, because if he doesn't, you're going to have to follow Dr. West. So, so uh, unfortunately, or fortunately maybe, I'm following Dr. West because he's, he's left you with a powerful message, and I guess you feel that spirit, and I want you to keep that spirit um, with you. And so I want to give greetings to everybody and say it is really a pleasure for me to be here. And it's really an honor for me to be here. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, why I'm standing here, why I'm following Dr. West and why I'm going before Dr. Karinga. Uh, but I got one good thing going for me. And that is, as I look out into this audience, I see the person that's most responsible for me as a scholar and my development as an intellectual and my mentor. That's Dr. Thaddeus Mathis. He is here. And so. Whatever I say uh, this afternoon, if I say it right, credit goes to him. And if I say it wrong, give him credit also uh, for that. Uh, I don't know about the other presenters, but the other presenters probably got a call like I received a call. And that call said something like I got a call from Dr. Santi. He said, we're having a conference, Afrocentric International. We want you to speak. I said, oh, OK, I'd be honored. Let me check my calendar, so on and so forth. Let me know when it is. Uh, I'll see if I can speak. Call them back and say, I'm able to do it. And at that moment, I thought, I got to work on a presentation. I got to develop a paper. I got to be clear about what I want to say. I never got a call back that said, uh, submit anything. The next thing I got was the program with the title on. And it said, you will speak to this issue. And I thought to myself, how do they know how to do that? You know, I mean, what makes them think I can just speak to, to that issue? And then I sat here this morning and this afternoon and I read the program and I looked over the people and I heard the inspirational presentations that people made. And I realized that when you're working with Dr. Asante or Dr. Mazama, uh, it's not about the talk. You can talk the talk, but you, be, you have to be able to walk the walk. And so what they're able to do is identify activist scholars. And I think that's what they brought to you today and tomorrow. The people who are out there doing stuff. And so I'm assuming and I'm hoping the reason why they picked the topic is because in my many encounters, my many opportunities to work with these two renowned scholars, I'm always talking about problems related to racism, problems related to issues in the black community. And some of you may be like me where I see race in everything, but I'll get back, that, back to that in a minute. I want to say um, thank you for all those previous presenters. And again, I think your presentations were inspiring. And I too want to say thank you to Kenny Gamble who probably didn't know that he was a philanthropist like 30 years ago. Uh, but I can tell you they've been given that long. Um, Dr. Santi indicated I have an organization called Afro One Dance Drama and Drum Theater, and it's in Willingboro, New Jersey. And about 30 years ago or so, as we were struggling and begging everybody to do something for us, we had somebody approach him and say, we need money for an ad, for a book. Give us some money. And he did. <laughs> And it wasn't a whole lot of money, but it was, the pro the, it was the thought that went behind it. And the fact that we could put it in our book, Gamble and Huff, celebrates Afro One, Dance, Drum, and Drum Theater, we thought we were famous, you know? And that was very important to us. And so, so they probably don't remember that $40 that they gave, but that $40 um, really, really did go a, a very, very long way. And so I'm here because I want to address this topic that I was given combating um, white racism and African indifference. 
And I have to say that I stand here, I stand here off, uh, in the presence of God, but also in the spirit of my ancestors. And I, I'm really moved by the opportunity to speak, um, one, because I lost somebody that was so very, very dear to me in the last um, two months. And it reminded me of just how much time we do not have left to deal with what I think are some of the critical issues. And as I was sitting there um, in, in the audience, I got a text. And the text said, um, uh, I'm on my way to Ohio because on Thursday, our brother Nick Nelson transitioned. And that um, the, the person who sent me the email said he was my mentor. And so I need to be there with his family. And as Dr. Santi indicated, that we served on the board of NCBS for a very long time with Dr. Nick uh, Nelson. And so my, my thoughts and my spirits are with him as well. And I want to say just quickly, that I don't have a PowerPoint, but I, I brought my voice. And I know that the spirit will move me and I will say what I need to say to you um, this afternoon. Uh, somebody said to me, in fact, his brother Jimmy Kirby back there said to me, welcome to Philadelphia. And I thought, why are you welcoming me? This is home. You know, I mean, I was born and raised here, uh, which is a good thing. Because as everybody's talking about the great things that happen in Philadelphia and what Philadelphia produces, I want to claim the fact that I was born and raised here. And even though I live in Jersey, I never say I'm a Jersey girl. And so I, as I walked in again, as I saw my mentor, and I said, oh my goodness, I'm nervous. What am I going to say? He said, open your mouth. And if you open your mouth, um, the words will flow. And so uh, unlike some people that Dr. West knows, I am not morally constipated. And so when I open my mouth, I am hoping that the message here uh, will, in fact, flow. And as I speak to you this brief time, and I, I just left our graduation as well. And if, if you're an academic, you know, every spring and sometimes every spring and winter, you got to put on the, the fancy academic stuff. You got to walk up and down the, the halls and you got to sit in the auditorium. And you got to listen to people give speeches so somebody can graduate. And what you want to hear the graduation speaker say, first and foremost, is, I won't be long. You know, you sort of wait for that message. I won't be long. Because you're hoping that somebody doesn't get up and just dominate the mic. So I want to say, I won't be long, but I will be informative. And hopefully my words you'll take with you, and perhaps they will have meaning to you as they have to me. And I just want to leave you with a couple things. I'm here today because I really do want to raise some questions about the struggle that we continue to face. And I want to share with you, as I've already said, my concerns and my fears that we don't have a whole lot of time left. When I say we don't have a whole lot of time left, I'm talking about those in my um, generation. And I remember, one of the things I remember about being in Philadelphia is that I used to be young. And it was important that when I was here, and I was young, and the experience of my youth had a tremendous impact on me. And I always say I'm a child of the 60s. And I think that that's probably one of the most fortunate things that ever happened to me, that I was born in the 50s and got raised in the 60s. Because in the 60s, we had a different attitude about everything. And to come of age during the 60s when black was beautiful, when revolution was in the air, and if you ask me, I was waiting for the revolution to come any moment. Because I got the message from the radio that kept saying the revolution will not be televised. And so I knew it was coming. I thought somewhere in North Philly, all I had to do was watch TV, you know, Channel News, Channel 6 Action News, and then run to North Philly when the revolution came. And so, you know, I was waiting on the revolution. I was preparing myself for the revolution. I remember as a teenager how radical I was allowed to be. I remember the moment in my life in the 1960s when I washed all the heat out my hair and went natural. And I remember going around the school with my uncut, unshaved natural. And people, as I was a child, used to say, oh, she's such a cute little girl. But they stopped saying I was cute when I washed my hair out, you know? And I remember thinking, we're about to take the power. And I wanted to be so much, I wanted to be part of that movement. Well, like some of you, I waited and I waited and I waited. And that revolution didn't come, not the way I had hoped it would. But I do want to say I recognize that some things have changed, but they haven't changed enough. And I say they've changed, and again, although my background is not quite as colorful, I was not a gangster. I just happened to be a poor child in Philadelphia. And I was a poor child in a family of nine, raised by my mom, and at some point, you know, we were identified as a poor welfare family. The last thing I thought I would have in my life was an opportunity to do anything. I thought that if I had a shot at anything, it would be that I could get a job, make a minimum wage. And in fact, as a child of the 60s, no one in our community talked about college. No one talked about advanced education. All people talked about is either you got married and you had children or you found a job. And the job that you found were the limited jobs, 
restricted by the fact that the high schools that you went to weren't going to prepare you for anything else but a low-level job. And so I remember very clearly when I went to high school. I went to John Bartram High, a school that I love. Went to John Bartram High, and I remember going through the curriculum in six weeks, and there was really nothing else for me to learn because I was being trained in commercial clerical. And that basically meant I was trained to operate an office machine. And when I graduated, people kept saying, well, she's really bright, but you know, she's in commercial clerical. And I graduated in, in the top fifth of the class, but I had a degree in commercial clerical. And I went out to get a job. And I went to a place, they said, we got a job for you. And I said, what kind of job is it? Said, it's a file clerk. And I was excited because I was gonna get paid. And if you were poor, you wanted a job, it didn't matter. And so I went to this job and, and I, I went and I presented myself and I said, I want this job. And I think at the time they were gonna pay me $1.60 an hour. And I was hungry for that $1.60 an hour. And so they interviewed me and then they said, you know, you're hired for the job. And I was so thrilled. I was so thrilled that I had this job. And a little white lady came up and they said, she'll show you what to do. And she took me into a room, a closet. It had boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes. And I said, what is this? She said, this is the file room. And she said, these are the files. I said, how long have you been here? She said, I have been here 40 years. I went out to lunch and I never came back. Because I said at that moment, this is not what God intended for me to do. You know, I, I, I couldn't do it. And from that moment on, it was a question of, well, what are you going to do? And fortunately for me, it was the midst of the movement. And fortunately for me, I had a little bit of talent. And while I'll reserve myself today, I won't start dancing and all that up here. But one of the things I was able to do was dance. And during that period in 1960s, everybody was trying to tell the story of the black, poor black child. And I was part of a musical called Wake Up Man and Live. And we went around to all of the white suburbs, scaring everybody to death, talking about what was coming. <laughs> you know, this was coming. And we happened to land, and I, I, I'm speaking the truth here, I really am. We happened to land on a, on a campus, a campus of all white girls, uh, on Main Line, Philadelphia, called Cabrini College. And when we arrived, they were frightened. Uh, but we got out, we started doing our thing, and we brought a speaker with us. And the speaker walked up to the dean at that time and said, how do you like having this all white racist school? And the dean was offended. So what are you saying? He said, I don't see any black girls around here. Uh, within a few hours, I think, I was tapped on the shoulder and said, you want to come to this college? <laughs> now, you have to understand, my preparation was in commercial clerical. I wasn't even sure what college was about. But one of the things my mama taught me, who was not educated, that if the windows open, you fly through. If the doors open, run through. So someone said, you want to come to college? I said, oh, OK, yeah, I'll come to college. You know, I went home. I got nine brothers and sisters. I said, I'm going to college. The brother next to me fell on the floor, rolled around, <laughs> laughing, screaming. He said, that's what you get from hanging around with those white people. They have screwed your head off. They make you think you're going to be so you're never going to college. And I said, they said I was going to college. And so I got a letter from Cabrini College. Said, you have been awarded a full tuition scholarship. I had to check with everybody in the neighborhood. Anybody know what this is? <laughs> Does anybody know what this means? Does anybody know? You know, a couple of people trying to say, oh, full tuition means you don't have to pay. Well, it was a good thing, because welfare people can't pay for college. And right before I went to college, they sent a note that said, you owe $90 in fees. My mama said, well, you can't go, because we don't have $90. And I thought, my life has changed for $90. But later on that evening, I'm out dancing on stage somebody. And obviously, the person who directed this play said to somebody at a religious institution, a, prep, a Presbyterian church, that girl, she don't get $90. She's not going to college. <laughs> and at the end of the show, the, the, the minister walked up and said, we have a special award. We're going to give Patricia Reed $90. And I was like, there's something about this world that's supposed to work, all right? And so having said all that, I remind myself on a daily basis how fortunate I am. I'm not where I am because I'm the brightest, or as my sister said, you're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I might not be, but I took advantage of opportunity and I stand on the shoulders of those who struggled before me to get here. And so one of the things I learned when I went into the doors at Cabrini College well, this thing is all about race. That race has a lot to do with the opportunities I have and the opportunities I have not had. 
And so the three things I want to talk about today, one of them is this concept of race. Because I think we've coming, we're coming to a misunderstanding now of what race is all about. And I think that some of that uh, that's happening is very deliberate. And so now you have people saying to us, you know, this race is not a biological reality. I'm going to conferences where people are standing up presenting now and saying race is not real. It's not real to who? It's real to us. It's been socially constructed in such a way that we suffer from it, you know? And then when I say race, I mean, I need to understand that I belong to somebody. Now, everybody else claims the right to belong to people. I want to belong to people, too. And so when you tell me race is no longer real, I, I don't understand what that means. And so I do want to say something about race. And then I want to say something about racism. And I want to talk about what we can do or what we should do, given now that we're in 2013. I think that when we say race uh, is not real, it depends on who the speaker is. And I know for many of us, it's a day-to-day -day reality. And what I find quite amazing is that sometimes the more educated we become, the more we develop a certain kind of amnesia about what's real in the world. And so when we talk about cures, I don't have it, but an anti-amnesia pill would be something that worked real well for people who had forgotten what it's like to be a member of this large group called black people or African people. And I think that the people on the street, the masses, they still know. And you don't have to remind them. And I know last week, or the week before last, many of you were fascinated by the unfolding of that story, the horrific story in Ohio about the kidnapping story. And as I'm watching this, I couldn't help but look at this brother who spoke so clearly. And they asked the brother, what happened? He said, look, when a pretty young white girl come running and jump into the arms of a black man, something's wrong. And I thought, you know, now I'm sure y'all saw that on TV last week, right? You know, and I'm like, uh, on a very fundamental level, this brother knows if a white girl comes running towards a black man, desperately, okay, something is wrong. I also, I also saw the story, you're talking about, you know, do we understand race and do we understand racism? I live in New Jersey right outside of Trenton. And last week, there was a horrific story in the paper. And the story was a paper about a mother who, was, who kept her kids, they were living in a storage unit. Her name is Sheena Johnson. And it was all over the paper, she was arrested, you know, they had her in an orange jumpsuit, and she was, of course, she was a black woman. And I said, you know, to everybody, this is racism. They said, no, how could it be? Because if it was a white woman who had left her children, yes. if they were living in a storage unit, they would have said, this is a mother who has done everything possible to keep her family together. Yes. And she would have been viewed as a person with potential. Yes. But the black face said, you're negligent. We're putting you in jail. And, and, and one of the things that, uh, a slight positive out of that story, is that the Trenton community has emerged to raise enough money for bail. And when they asked the woman what happened, she said, I ran out of options. Of course she did. But instead of celebrating the fact that she did whatever she could to keep her family together, she's been victimized because she's a black woman, you're a bad mother, you're going to jail. And so we see those, those sorts of differences related to race. And I know, sometimes I do get carried away. You know, I, you know, I raise children. And I've heard this story from, um, from uh, other people who raise children. You know, I'm worried about my children not being conscious enough. If you were raised in the 60s or 70s, consciousness was everywhere. You could, you could just feel it. But when you moved your children out of the city and you started raising them, you wanted to make sure they understood this is what it is to be black in this world. And you know, sometimes your kids would turn to you and they'd say stuff, stuff like, um, you know, you talk about that black stuff too much, you know. And, and you know, that was sort of bothersome. And you know, they have to get an experience to help them understand that. You have to come to grips with what it is being black in the world. And they would say, yeah, but you know, mom, you get too carried away. You get too carried away. And I'm thinking, well, I, I, I see race in everything. That's why I said, I see race in everything. And just a couple days ago, I live in a rural area in, in New Jersey, and I was coming down the road, and I live near horse farms. And I drove by, and I saw a very odd sight. It was very odd. Horses were all lying down on the ground, which you almost never see. They were all brown horses lying down on the ground. And in the middle of the brown horses was a white horse. I stopped the car. I said, wait. I said, no, no, this is not race here. I said, you know, you are really, really, you know, getting carried away. But, but let me tell you why I tell you that story. Because if you are really conscious about what's happening in this world, you can't afford to have a moment when you're not cognizant about the impact of race. You can't afford it. And so, you know, yes, I had to catch myself, and I realized I had gotten, I still don't know why that white horse was standing in the middle, but 
I am sure that that's not an example of um, racism, uh, because I'm going to give you some real examples of what they, what they are. And I want to say something about, we have to revisit our understanding of the concept of race. And I know what race is, and I want to tell you what my definition is and what, I be, what I'm dealing with as I speak to my students and I talk to people about why we got to fight this, this evil called racism. And we know this is a pseudo uh, psycho concept, a psychoscientific concept that was developed around mid 17th century. And you know the purpose of it was for the dehumanizing of a global population. And we know that that dehumanization of that global population has followed us all of those years. I don't want us to confuse race and racism with, a, with concepts like um, conflict. Because even before the concept of racism, there was tribal conflict, there was ethnic conflict, there was family conflict. What we're dealing with now is the, flat, the fact that overall, on top of all of that, they applied this concept of racism. And they developed it to perfection. They developed it to the point where you can be a racist now and not even know it. You can just step into office and assume the policies of a nation that are just as racist as they've ever been. And so, you know, we have to understand what that means. And so we know that there's a group of people, a global group of people, that for whatever reason are victimized. And they're victimized on an ongoing basis. And I remember coming up in Philly. We used to th say things like, especially during the movement period, the blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. We used to say that all the time. What I would say now, the blacker the berry, the greater the suffering. Because no matter where you are in the world, the darker hued people tend to suffer the most. And again, I'll give you pr uh, plenty uh, examples of what that means. And so while there's various definitions of race, there's also some convoluted kinds of movement to distort what race is in our understanding of race. And so what we have now, especially in this country, we really are confused about race because we had this constant historical experience of miscegenation all over the place. We have that. We have this constant flow of immigration, which means people are constantly coming in and out. And so when you ask people who they are, one would hope that they would say, I'm African. But more and more people say they are not. And so one of the things that's become very confusing is how do you begin to identify people? And do people want to be identified as part of, the, uh, part of a racial group? One of the things I know for sure, if you give people a choice, what they will choose not to be more often than not is a member of that category called black or African. They choose, I don't want to be a part of that. And we see historically again how that's starting to unfold. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this. But the concept of race has become so confusing and so uh, abstract in the United States that now the US Census Bureau is considering reclassifying Hispanic as a racial group. Now that is a fundamental error. Hispanics at best, first of all, is a misnomer. It claims that everybody who speaks the language got something in common. But how many African Spanish speaking brothers and sisters do you know? And so what the Census Bureau is talking about now is maybe we can just make Hispanic a racial group. And why is that important? Because so many Hispanic folk, Latinos, are saying we don't want to be classified if it's going to that group that's called African or black. We want to be something else. And so the Census Bureau in the last decade or so has started to give people options. Well, you can check more than one category. Now, you know what has happened. Our numbers have declined. And it's not because there are fewer of us. But because if you give people an option, many people who, who um, are still suffering, not, you know, not having an understanding of who they are or wanting to be a part of this group, will say, well, I'm not African or I'm not black. And if you teach as I do every semester when I teach race, ethnicity, and diversity, I get a group of students, black students, who are the first to tell me, don't call me black and don't call me African because I'm something else. Well, honey, where are you? You know, like, which group do you um, belong to? And what they invariably say, I'm mixed, uh, aren't we all? <laughs> you know, uh, aren't we all? You know, last time I checked, I said, I think they said fewer or 5% of the U.S. population could claim that they were 100% African. So what does it mean? I've also heard people say, you know, that crazy stuff about the one drop rule, that's crazy. But that's part of our reality. And that's part of what we accepted as what makes us whole as a group. And so when people say, when people like Harry, uh, Halle Berry say, I don't care what y'all say, I'm black, my daughter black, we're going to be black. I understand that because she wants to be part of a group. And so we asked ourselves, who are we calling ourselves now? Are we part of a community? 
So we have to understand race, the concept of race, and how we're using race. Because I think as we change the definition of race, more and more people will decide, I really am not a member of that group. And if they're not a member of that group, it creates some problems for us. One of the things that I've witnessed at Stockton, and I'm assuming this is happening on other campuses as well, is that we're experiencing a tremendous divide now. Among our own people, we're experiencing a tremendous divide. When I was coming up, everybody that looked slightly like you was part of the community. They could be high yellow, as we used to say. They could be red bone. They could be black as coal. Everybody was black. If they spoke with an accent, it didn't matter. You were still black. When you scratched the surface, you found that the people were from different places. They were from the Caribbean. They may have been from Cuba. They could have been you know, recent um, people from the continent. But everybody was black. Now everybody wants to claim more. I'm uniquely ethnic, and I want to claim that. And this is, not, this is not to say people don't have a right to define themselves. They do. And this is not to say people shouldn't embrace their heritage. They should. Uh, but it does present us with certain kind, kind of challenges. And so now what we have at Stockton, we started out with what was called Unified Black Student Society. And that included everybody of color. Unified Black everybody. And so we had all the black people that looked black, all that didn't look black, all the spats. We had everybody. Well, first the Latinos said, well, we're not really all that black, so we're going to create our own organization. OK, they created their own. Then the Caribbean students said, well, you know what? We're not quite black like y'all. We, we're Caribbean. So we're going to create our own um, institution, uh, organizations, OK? Then the African students say, you know what? We're not, we're African. We're not black like y'all Africans. We're, we're different. We're going to create our own. So what we started to have was the proliferation of organizations that were more closely tied to an ethnic or a national experience than anything else. So what happened to the unified concept? It started to disappear. And when you talk to the groups about, can we all come together? They would say interesting things like, well, our agenda is not the same as yours. And so we, I see this division. And I don't think it's happening just at our schools, because it's happening in our communities as well. And so as I ride around my old community, new community, we see religious organizations for certain groups. The, Baptist, the Haitian Baptists, we want our own <laughs> church. We see separate, we see the African Baptists, we want our own separate things. And so I think somewhere along the line, we've forgotten about what it means to be part of this organization, of this um, community of people called black folk or African people. And if we're going to achieve anything in our near future, we're going to have to unify. We're going to have to unify ourselves. I think there's no better time than now to revisit this concept of pan-Africanism, something that sort of faded away that needs to come back if people are going to be able to come together and work against what continues to be one of the number one evils that we face throughout this country and this world, and that's this concept of racism. And when I talk about racism, I'm very clear about what I mean. I mean the extent to which you've assumed the group is, is, is sup, uh, superior on the one hand and another group is inferior. And since the topics here we're focusing on white racism, we have ample examples of the fact that the white community has created this racist notion and has applied it throughout this country historically and in contemporary point, um, sense of the word, and they applied it throughout the global community. And so how do I know racism exists? I know because I see it every single day. I see it every single day. I see it on the news. I read it in the newspaper. And when I drive up and down the streets, I see it. But because I'm a social worker, I check the social indicators. And what do I discover? It's the same thing that Dr. West has indicated. It doesn't matter if the area is education, employment, um, um, incarceration, housing, mental health, mortality, morbidity, no matter what you look at, the figures say we are suffering more than others. And there's no other example, there's no other reasoning, except that race is a factor. And if we are suffering because of race, it means we're carrying a disproportionate social burden, and we can't live to our fullest. They teach us in social work about the opportunities to help people to develop to their fullest potential. That's hard in a racist world. That's hard in an area in where race is still applied on a daily basis. Now, some people will say to you, oh, it's no longer about race. You know, we are in a post-racial uh, moment here. We live in a post-racial society. I want to tell you how dangerous that notion is. We're not post-racial anything. And if we haven't learned, and although for some of you, I guess you may have learned a lesson in the last four or five years, but I had the unique experience of being at an institution where for 20 years, 
the head of that institution, the president of that institution was an African-American woman. And in 20 years, I think we hired two African-American faculty members. And so people would say to us, how come you black folk aren't saying anything? Because we weren't prepared. We weren't prepared to deal with what happens when the people look like us, but they act like the others. And that's when you have to understand that you can develop certain policies that are racist. All you gotta do is change the person at the top. It doesn't mean that anything else is gonna change in, in the society or the institution. So this notion of post-racial, of course, it's a myth. I know it's not post-racial because again, I checked the figure. We're still at 27% poverty rate for black families. 54% of African-American children live in poverty. If any other group was suffering like that, somebody would be doing something. Somebody would be protesting. But of course, as was said earlier, to a certain extent, I think perhaps we have lost our voice. We have lost our voices. We have lost our sense of consciousness. And part of that is because we didn't do our job. When I say we didn't do our jobs, I'm talking about those of us who, in fact, were part of the 60s generation. Here's the great myth that we fell into in the 60s and the 70s. We were about change. We were changing things everywhere. We could walk up and down the street, and people were threatened by the fact that we were about to make change. As my colleague and friend and mentor used to say, Dr. Mathis, when we got in the elevators, people moved to the side because you never knew what we were going to do. And so we thought, as we moved through the civil rights movement, the black power uh, movement, we thought we obtained some things. Now, some of us were co-opted um, co and moved on. It became exactly like we hoped they would never would be. But we moved into the 70s and the 80s and the 90s with a sense that we had accomplished something. When you go back and check the curriculums in the schools, you realize we didn't accomplish a darn thing. They're still teaching the same history that I was taught, you know, in the 1950s. We thought that we change some things, that we make things better for our people. When you look at the major social welfare institutions that take care of the needs of the people, the faces are different, but the results are the same. Our, our children are still suffering disproportionately. Our families are still disrupted. And so one of the things we thought we were able to do is to make a change and an impact on the next generation. I'm not so sure that we were able to do that. And so when I say I'm concerned, and I speak out of the voices and the concerns of my ancestors. I don't want those of us who were part of that generation to pass on to our transition and not revisit our responsibility to engage this community all over again. And if you ask me, okay, we know race is here. We know they still apply concepts of race. We know racism is real. We have evidence. I can tell you about the unemployment, the housing, and all that. What am I talking about, the United States? I could be talking about Great Britain. I could be talking about Cuba. I could be talking about France. Wherever black people are, something goes wrong in delivery of services and availability of resources and opportunities. Something goes wrong and is related to the color of our skin. It's because we are African people. And so we have to do some things that we expect to overcome the current situation that we're in. Some things have not changed. If you ask, what do we need to do to combat white racism? Well, first, we have to be educated. We can't have a generation of students leaving college with degrees. And when you raise the questions with them about race and racism, they say things to you like, oh, that was back in the 60s. We don't have those issues now. Or we failed, if that's what they're saying. We have to educate so people know how to identify when race is a factor. We have a group of young people, again, some of who are, we're very proud of and they are very sophisticated, but others who cannot even detect when they're in the midst of a racist situation. They don't seem to know. And part of that is because the bourgeois people among us tried to protect that next generation. And so they moved them in situations and in areas and they told them, I don't see color. Well, are you blind? Is, you know, if you can't see the color, are you blind? And so what we have is a, a group of young people who are not clear about the continuation of racist practice in this country and again throughout the world. Of course we have to agitate. Things haven't changed that much, the agitation doesn't work and we have to protest. We have ample example of what will happen if we protest. But we're being challenged more now than we were in the past. When you get in the elevator, nobody moves to the side anymore. They stand there, claim their space. And so people come into your homes, your communities, on your territory and decide they're gonna dismantle what you're all about. You're gonna have to fight back. 
And the way in which we have to fight back is we're going to have to challenge this current generation to engage themselves in a struggle, in a struggle that says that we are not, I mean, you know, in the 60s we used to say, none of us are free until all of us are free. We still need to say that again. You know, we can't talk about how we've achieved if when you look around, you cannot determine whether or not the brother or the sister next to you can make it along with you. And I used to say, and I have plenty of stories that speak to my truth as having been a person that was raised in the ghetto poor community, end up making it to the top as far as I'm concerned. And it doesn't matter when my young children walked out the door, nobody knew their mama had a doctor. They didn't care. And so when my son turned 16, first thing he said to me is, Mom, I want my car. I said, now you've been hanging around white people too long because we don't, we, don't do, we don't do that. I will let you borrow my car, but you're not getting a car. Well, I got a brand new car. I work. I, oh, I deserve it. So I let my son drive my brand new car in the state of New Jersey and on the New Jersey Turnpike. And let me tell you what the result was. On, almost on a daily basis, he was stopped. Young black male behind the wheel of a new car, he must be doing something wrong. Nobody knows his mama is a doctor somewhere, a professor somewhere. What he always knew <laughs> was, I cannot get in trouble here because if you mess with me, my mama's going to kill y'all. And that was true. That, was, that part was true. But no one could tell that these were quote unquote middle class kids. So it didn't matter. And so unless all the young black kids are free, it doesn't matter to me that, that minds may have a, a, a opportunity because the opportunity was limited by the fact that once they walked outside the door, they were an average black male or a black female and they had to confront the same realities that every other average black male and black female have to confront. I think we have to have a conversation with this generation that talks about what their responsibilities are and will talk about what their contribution will be. Every generation is supposed to make a contribution to the struggle. What will your contribution be? And we are more challenged uh, than ever before because we no longer have control of what they hear and what they see and what they do. I'm amazed at the wonders of the internet. I'm totally amazed. But it's like a train that has left the station that can't be stopped. So our young people have access to information like we never had before. They have access, but they don't know what to do with it. You know, it's there, but they don't know what to do with it. We talked about they don't know how to critically think. They don't know how to organize. They don't know how to engage. How can they? All they have to do is push a button on the Google system and everything they need is right there for them. And so we have to say, what is going to be our, what is going to be our program to help engage these people all over again? Well, if you can find a, a blatant racist, a racist experience, you should let your children have it. Because that is what tells them, oh, my mom and my daddy weren't lying to me. No matter what I said in the home, it wasn't until my kids left the house, went to Rutgers, and the president got up and said, you know, you people, oh, they jumped up, well, who are you talking about? You know? <laughs> and so I said to them, after they found their level of consciousness, I tried to tell you, but it was nothing like the experience that got them on the right track. And so, without harming them, let them experience some of the realities of the world so they can join us in this struggle. I want to say that our elders who are still with us, they understand, they continue to understand. And they have some questions as to how come we're not doing more? I have an 87 year old mother and a 91 year old mother-in-law. Both of them are still, thank God, in their right mind. And so I went to talk to my mother and we were watching a situation where they were giving some benefit to a young white female who had done some horrific crime. I think it was like Casey Athley or something like that. And they were saying how she was free and, and I said to my mother, can you believe that? She said, yeah, because she white, right? Now, my mother, 87, and she said, yeah. She said, they always had more um, benefits than us. And I thought, she's 87 and she knows that. Then I had a talk with my 91-year-old mother-in-law. And she said, you know, and uh, I forgot to bring you all greetings from the National Black United Fund where my husband, William T. Merritt, is the uh, CEO. And so usually he and I are out challenging the world all the time. And so we were talking to her, and she knows that this is how we spend our time, our time. And she said to us, well, when are y'all going to do something more about how they treat the colored people? 
And I said, are colored people being treated bad? She said, every day until you die. And I thought, she knows something. So we got a generation of older people who have memory, and they know the struggle is not over. We have our generation who engage in the struggle and made some advances, but we got another generation that we have to bring along. And as I said before, this is, now is the time to renew our familiarity with the concept of Pan-Africanism. Because if we're going to win this battle, we're going to have to do it all together. And if we're going to win this battle, we're going to have to organize. We're going to have to organize ourselves, our families, our community. We have to organize within the diaspora because that's what we have to do to, do, to engage this fight against white racism. And what I say that we know is true, that we have to be on the path for social change. And we can never lose sight of the fundamental need for social change and social justice, not just in America, but everywhere throughout this world. Thank you.